So thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and of course, for any National Gallery employee, coming to a Kenneth Clark theatre uh, has a very particular resonance. Um, before we start, just let's say a huge thanks to Katie Minter and Hannah for putting this event together. Um, as she said, I, I, we all speak it quite a lot of these things. This has been a very beautifully well put together event, so thank you very much for that. Um, thank you also for coming tonight. Uh, I realise it is very beautiful weather out there, so my promise to you is that the next hour is going to be at least as good as uh, two glasses of wine, two pints of beer at Gordon's Wine Bar just around the corner. Uh, so that is your, pri your value promise for the next uh, hour of your life. Um, before we get into dialogue, um, I was asked to kind of introduce and contextualise this a little bit about what virtual reality means. And really, I think in a very practical sense, as we talk about virtual reality tonight, we're talking about a context now where virtual reality as a kind of consumer technology is coming to be something that people use at mass and at scale. Um, you've heard the stories of how Oculus Rift, Google's Daydream, uh, Samsung Gear VR are coming now to hundreds of thousands and millions of people. So in a very practical sense, we're at some kind of tipping point in the market where the volume of people who get access to virtual reality technology is now coming at a large scale. But I think we have to back away from that very practical question to think if we're going to think about art and about museums to think about what virtual reality means in those contexts. And just to give a bit of context for you about what I think that means, we can talk about a little about what virtual reality means as both an art practice and what it means as a kind of museological practice. If we think about what it means as art, to do virtual reality as a type of art. Um, I think you have to look really back off a little bit and think about the question of what technology and art means all together. Um, the best explanation of that I ever saw uh, was in Martin Heidegger's uh, work, um, uh, Technology and the Question of Art. And what, what he says in there is really that uh, technology is something, a uh, framework through which you get access to meaning. And through that frame, Art reveals the meaning of what he calls being, but in a very simple way is about the meaning of what life is about. And I think that's a very simple way to think about what virtual reality means as a type of meaning for what art means. Because ultimately it is a technology through which we can create things as a type of artistic practice, but it only becomes art if that technology ultimately disappears and the art itself and the meaning that that art conveys comes through more importantly than the technology itself does. And that's exactly what happened as other technologies came into the world of art. We don't read a book now and think about the technology of putting ink on paper. And we don't look at a painting and think about the technology of how you make canvas and how you produce oil paint. These are all human technologies created by people using process to create technology. And virtual reality is a new method of doing that, but we should see it possibly as no more of a new method of doing that than any other type of artistic medium and any other art type of artistic practice. And we'll talk particularly tonight a little bit about the emerging practice of what it means to make art in virtual reality. And so we can say, well, have artists always therefore been creating virtual reality? Uh, and I think that's a very interesting way to look at that, is that if you go right back hundreds of thousands of years to African rock art, uh, my old employers at the British Museum held thousands of amazing examples of African rock art. What are they doing there in that amazing act of putting uh, pigment onto stone? is in some sense creating a virtual reality environment in which to consume meaning. Some of that great African rock art looks at things like a set of antelopes being apparently hunted by a hunter, but those antelopes have bleeding eyes. And from those bleeding eyes, you can work up that they're not actual antelopes, these are spiritual entities that exist in a parallel virtual realm to the real world the hunter lives in. And so even back 100,000 years ago, people are questioning the boundary of the real and the virtual in the art that they create. I was walking around the National Gallery a, a couple of days ago and looking at some of the amazing works of uh, Peter Boring and the Elder held there. And there's this amazing work about uh, Adam and Eve where you have a set of animals posing clearly for a picture being painted by a painter. But they all stand up front and centre and are waiting to look beautiful. And then through the back of it you can see a, uh, Adam and Eve pulling the apple from the tree. And this itself of course is a type of virtual reality where you can see a world being made where not only what you're supposed to look at is there, but a whole world behind it that you might not be supposed to look at, again, is creating meaning for itself. And you can look at Rothko and the great abstract impressionists, again, is creating kinds of immersive environment that we can move into and explore through the use of tonality and through the depth of colour that comes through them. So in some sense, uh, to me, artists have always been creating virtual reality. We just never gave it that name before. 
If we look at the parallel question around what that means then in museums, again, should we ask the question, have museums and galleries always been about the creation of virtual reality environments? And if you look at how museums and galleries work, I mean, again, to me, they have always been doing this just through different mediums from the one we now have access to now. And so if I talk to my old boss at the British Museum, Hartwig Fisher, the way he describes what museums do is they create worlds through words. You have an object that you encounter in a kind of phenomenological way, where it's you and the object together trying to uh, understand meaning. And what the museum does is put words between you to help you elaborate on what that meaning is. Interpretation, panels on the wall, books that explain what it means. Those words have been creating the world around the work and giving it meaning and context. That meaning is sometimes expressed not just through written words, but through the voice, the curatorial narrative that tells you what it means and creates a centre, an auditory environment in which you can experience it. And of course, the buildings themselves are virtual reality environments in one way or another. The amazing architecture that goes back from uh, the work done in places like the British Museum hundreds of years ago to then amazing new museum environments such as those being created by Jean Nouvel, particularly in Abu Dhabi and Qatar, which are creating incredible sensory environmental realms in which to experience content and the meaning of art and culture. So again, this is, to me, is a question ultimately of terminology. We didn't used to call these things virtual reality because a technology called virtual reality didn't exist. But a practice of creating virtual reality has been endemic in the way that, that these type of institutions have worked for centuries, and possibly even, I said, in the context of Akronokola, for millennia. So let's go out of the theoretical and into the practical. So kind of where do we sit now? Because there are clearly some things emerging very fast now about what it means to use this practical technology called virtual reality with kind of capital V and a capital R that we can see starting to happen. The first is about artistic creation in virtual reality. We'll talk more about that tonight. You can see a type of practice emerging which is different from what it meant to paint, different from what it means to sculpt, and is emerging as a new kind of way of making art. We're seeing alongside that a question of display in virtual spaces. The types of work Google are doing in um, uh, creating virtual reality environments in creating art are creating new ways and new places for where someone can consume art and be, make that encounter with it. And we're seeing also then the socialisation of that space. Facebook are coming interestingly into the, uh, the arts and virtuality market and what they're doing with it is they're trying to bring many people into that space all at the space at the same time. So that's the bit we can forget about art, is it's not just about the individual and encounter with an object, it's about collectives of people who encounters with objects and art. And that opportunity to bring people together through virtual spaces to consume and encounter content together is a very, very powerful moment. So something is happening. Uh, what that means, we don't know. The point of this debate is not to answer that question. Uh, the point of the debate is to talk about some of the threads that that picks up um, and to start a conversation that ultimately continues with you. And really critically, the last 15 minutes of this should be the best bit, because ultimately then you get to ask questions and tell us what you think about this, because an institution like this is people, full of people thinking brilliant thoughts about the future of art. So this only works if you join in that conversation at the end. Um, so we're going to start with a question then around uh, thinking about virtual reality as an artistic medium. Um, we're starting to see this coming through very fast now. And I'm one of the brilliant pioneers of this new artistic medium. Where do you think, what is different from this from doing traditional art? What, what's new in the way the practice works? Um, okay, let's, let's, let's step back for a second and just say why I, I use it, I guess. Because um, I work across sort of quite a few media, it's not just virtual reality. I've actually only done one project in virtual reality. But um, the reason I was asked is because I make. Um, a lot of work with uh, computer technology and moving image, and then um, uh, I've done some app work as well. So most of my work revolves around bodies and touch and thinking about what um, mediated images do to how we think about bodies, and that's how I approach technology. So when I was, I suppose it really had me to, to uh, if I wanted to make a work in VR, I thought, well, this is. Potential, you know, there's a potential here to make a uh, video work which is um, immersive and, and um, you know, it is performative and it, it makes you think about your body in, in various ways because 
Um, I mean, it's in a brain, right? It, it's literally, you get to move around like this and you get to see something outside of that kind of energetic boundary that, that the image is trapped in. And um, it's kind of interesting because actually your body isn't there. In this case, you look down and there's nothing there. You're just kind of floating eyeball, right? So that's, that's, there's a silliness in that. Yes. There's an interesting thing in that you're kind of just in floating presence. Um, but then how the work how the work feels that truly real um, materialised or um, how resolved it was was kind of an odd thing because of the remit of the, of the um, commission and kind of what we ended up doing was producing a new spray paint tool, mm. really. So, I mean, whether it was an artwork at all like that, I actually still don't know. Mm. In a way, it's kind of like making a, a brush for um, Photoshop 1993 or something. Yeah. Yeah, that's. I mean, that sense of a new material, something that Google tilt brush has come through as a, you know, as a, a new way for artists to express themselves. In the stuff that you've seen with Google, people working in this evening, how how have you seen them using it? What are, what are they doing with it? And what I mean, what kind of difference about that from the practice? It's interesting because we um, so when tilt brush first came out um, at the lab. Um, in Paris, we invited, um, it was more street artists to kind of play around with it and they, you know, they, it felt very a natural extension for them to be working, um, it, working with the tool. And then, um, so that was kind of last year and then since then we've been working with a, a range of different artists. So we did something with, um, with Art Basel where they were really interested in kind of the experimentation for artists to start experimenting with this tool and what that means. And um, so we had so from Chow Fei, um, you know, who works a lot with kind of multimedia, to um, Robin Road, to Boy Child, a really range of different artists. And they spent three days um, where they just experimented. And I think one of the things that can happen, and having had conversations with them, is that it can become about the technology, particularly when you get into grips with technology for the first time. And I think what's, so it's very much why in terms of how we how we've been, we see ourselves as a facilitator. You know, we're not there to create art, but it's to be able to collaborate with artists who inf artists have informed kind of new tools and things in Tiltbrush and how Tiltbrush has developed. But it's how to kind of push that for the artists and beyond that, so that you kind of you know you you've got the craft, you've mastered the craft of the technology but that's also technology that's constantly changing. And then so that you can really push as artists um, what's possible. And um, just coming back to questions, so I've had artists so from choreographers who are looking, um, who have said it actually helps them in terms of the rehearsal process and, and body and movement. Um, and Xiao Fei, who, when she worked with it, she actually wanted to create a mixed reality film. And she said she's since then been and she uses the tool and virtual reality in Tilbush in particular to um, in her creative process. And I think there's something interesting about using it in the creative process rather than necessarily always being this finished product. Um, can I just add to that? Also, um, recently there was a project that was commissioned by uh, the Royal College of Art um, with uh, uh, an international international arts collective called Playgrounders who were working with a studio called Workflow, who just also happened to face uh, in Somerset House. Um, so they work collaboratively across, um, across different countries. They're based in Colombia and Spain and the UK and um, Copenhagen. So what they did was they developed this collaborative space where um, we could, they could all use the VR together. Also at the same time, the display became a performance that was a collaboration across four different people plugging into this VR environment in four different locations and um, uh, moving the objects within the space and speaking to the user throughout. But what, what, what's happened is experimentation, working with a studio who are utilising all of these different work, workflows, interfaces and platforms, is, um, it's created a space where they can collaborate as an arts collective, but where they can also bring in the, the, the audience as well. I, I just think it's a really interesting project. Mm -hmm. Can I add to that? It's a funny thing because um, this, this, this workflow, this way of working where um, someone offers you this new technology and says, okay, we want you to make something that we're using um, 
using technology we've never used before, um, and then we want to show it in a world class museum and promote it internationally. And they're like, okay, great. So, how do you use this thing, you know? And, and you know, there, there are certain, sometimes there are certain expectations or, or, or uh, um, pressures that are applied where, for example, for me, that there was, um, I was encouraged to make a 3D um, printed sculptural object extruded from whatever experience that I produced, but I was really, really encouraged to use Tilbrush. And of course, it, it turns out that Tilbrush doesn't make Adobe J files, it, you can't print something, it's a, it's a linear drawing thing. So, you know, what, what you can produce is um, it's completely delineated by the tools in your hands, you know. Mm -hmm. So, that's a that's kind of one of the things I found more interesting than actually what, you know, it's the, it's the failures and the miscommunications. Yeah. Is, is that really representative that this is so early? Yeah, I think it's so early. For me, I think it's completely yeah. speculative. Yeah. Yeah. And these conversations are really to be had in five years, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's why you should have them now. So yeah. that the five years time, it's an interesting thing that happens. And I think that there's a good dialogue, like there's an interesting dialogue between people who are wanting to experiment with these tools and the people who are developing them as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's total, there's a lot of experimentation going on within the art world. I think there are, I mean, we can talk about other um, areas that are actually just using like architecture, um, making really good use of, uh, of VR. And you know, loads of other um, industries, but specifically as a creative tool, we are in a moment of I mean, it's, it's an experiment <laughs> piece, and I think that for me is one of the interesting things is that the process now of making art has to slightly mimic the process of making new digital technologies, which, you know, if you know how Google works, is an iterative exploratory process which often runs into dead ends but then picks those dead ends and goes around and finds a different way. And what the art is and the, the, what the medium is is really yet to be established. One of the things I thought said was really interesting about that was the notion of what uh, the, that kind of disembodied eye in virtual space. The interesting comparison for that is that uh, that's exactly the description you would get of drones when they're being sent over to bomb people in Pakistan or uh, Afghanistan. Exactly the same description. And what happens when you have new technologies, you run into a kind of ethical bit where people get scared that that technology uh, is somehow breaking some kind of moral or ethical code and it all gets a bit too real. Uh, I'm of the right generation where I grew up playing Grand Theft Auto and the newspapers told me every day that from beating people to death with a baseball bat in Grand Theft Auto, I was going to go out and beat people to death with a baseball bat on the streets. And I still haven't done that. Um, although the Daily Mail editor is sometimes I think about it. Um, these concerns about the moral and ethical implications of this, we see even now with this, some of the work even on display in the course of it gets into a very it gets into a very real place with the act of violence and the act of uh, around it. How much should we be concerned about this? Is this something that artists, galleries, technology businesses should care about as they think through what this type of uh, work can be, or is it something that we should intentionally disregard as just being other people's concerns? Just to see the phrasing of that question is, is, is not what it's like to say, it, but um, I, I hate to cut you off. No, but but um, my, my theme really is that um, the way that that question is phrased leads us to a, a, a conversation about censorship, which is not necessarily the most useful thing, because as you said, we've had this conversation, we know what Grand Theft Auto does, and although this is an embodied uh, viewing mechanism, we will get used to it. Yeah. I think we will have we'll get used to it, and I don't think that it will happen. But what's the conversation we should be having? I don't know about should or shouldn't, but I think the more one of the more pressing things might be actually the production mechanism, and um, I mean potentially maybe if we're going to talk about content, it might be how you can use um, that first person. Um, position, narrative position to produce empathy and to produce a critical position to implicate the viewer's side to produce a critical conversation. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's more uh, for me in, in, in a separate attack like how these things get funded and to what end. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I think there are there, ethically, I mean, I don't think we're going to ignore the ethical implications, 
But I think you need to think about that with anything that you show, any memory, anything that you do. I think that's just a, a by the by. What, what you're saying about um, taking this first person position, I think we need to think about something I'm interested in is um, what positions are they and what voices are they that you're taking. Um, and if we're just going to you create what, what is the current sort of position, I think we have to think about that is one element, but I was thinking to think about it's also representation as, as along with any other sort of visual medium, it is an act of representing something, even though, yeah, it's this uh, sort of dialogue between representation and simulation and all of these kind of things. I think it's interesting to bring up something that I read, um, I think it's a recent article um, talking about this idea of moral panic. Um, which is, I, I mean, it's, it's happened throughout the history of art or the history of the development of technology in relation to art. Um, I'm, I'm not, I, I can't really, I, I don't know, I don't know how or what's going to happen in that regard. I don't know whether there's going to be some backlash and no one wants to uh, use the eye anymore because it's, you know, I don't, I don't know. In general, your pattern is that the media freaks out. You know, Turner Prize, Grand Theft Auto, there's a, there's a long trend of this stuff that goes at least as far back as the other and probably beyond. But the public doesn't freak out. The media freaks out, the public, yeah. it, and the consumption continues, and the practice continues, yeah. but it keeps on growing over time. Yeah. And the accommodation to the, the moral and ethical challenges continues to, to happen as it goes. But, the difference between the media and the public, which is probably getting ever starker and more painful as, as we go, gets wider. And the human's ability to actually sort of cogitate things and realise what things mean is much bigger than the others. Um, but I think at the moment, sorry, <laughs> there's a lot of, um, particularly at the moment, you know, fear of AI and fear of many things that VR is just another part of that conversation. And I guess. I will bring this up. Um, a, a major <laughs> a talking point with regards to moral panic or any of this stuff is one element of that is down to this Jordan Wilson work that is currently on view, which is called Real Violence. I don't know if anyone's seen it. Um, but that has sort of been something that's triggered this conversation. Um, and hopefully, uh, won't. I, I think it's a very specific kind of work, um, and hopefully it won't become like the dominant like VR piece that's spoken about with regards to um, the way it's used. Well, I mean, this is something we were talking about earlier. And it, yeah. It's. it's um, I haven't seen that piece, and I don't really want to comment on that specifically. But um, theoretically, the idea that a work um, implicates the viewer you, uh, as, as a as a spectator to a hyper-violent event that they have no control over but remain and watch. Um, it's, and I'll just with Wolfson's wider practice where really what he does over and over is present a really, really complex and often repellent subject position um, where we were just talking about it in terms of just reproducing real world problems without comment. Um, I, I think, you know, there, there are other artists who do similar stuff, like Ron Rockman does, 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 does very similar things in terms of Anxiety and um, you know reproducing white male acts, and um, I think the only way that we're gonna sort of work through the, that march is just by having more people use it. Really, I mean, one of the interesting things about the moment where we are now is that the practice of creating virtual reality art is is, is kind of triangulated now. That there is there are artists creating in the space. There are increasingly galleries and museums holding it. Uh, but in, in all of those con constellations, there is a, a technology business somewhere who is involved in that process one way or another. I mean, Google are obviously one of the great technology businesses involved in that space. Are there any points where, I mean, if you take something like the Jordan Wilson, where that involvement of a, a, a partner like Google, we've done so much across the art space, it's done so, added so much value to what that, where it will go, where there is, I think as you say, a kind of 
a question about who, who's funding what and for what purpose and where it becomes difficult to do certain types of art because of that triangulation potentially. But I think that's not really, I, I think that's not um, just about kind of virtual reality. I think that's, that's the, a much broader conversation about kind of arts funding in general and who's funding the arts. And I think the, the, and the exactly the same kind of questions should be asked as are asked in terms of any, any type, type of funding. I don't, I, I don't know, but I don't see that there's something different going on here. No, but it's more pronounced um, in that um, a lot of the ways, um, a lot of the reasons that um, artists are being allowed to use these technologies, they're being given access to these technologies through marketing agencies and mm -hmm. um, a number of the exhibitions have really actually been organised rather than curated by actually marketing people, yeah. um, which has been really surprising and shocking and you know, for example my experience of the virtual burial um, uh, commission was that I was told specifically no sex and no religion, you know, because of the CEO of HCC. Right. And I'm not afraid to talk about these things yeah, yeah. because it's done, but um, you know, that's why I'm kind of interested in what. Yeah, so, in so it's interesting. In terms of how, in terms of like, so I can talk specifically in terms of how we work. Um, so, at the, so Google Arts and Culture, as I mentioned, we have this lab, and it is where we bring kind of creative and tech communities um, together, and it's very much around experimentation. And kind of our position in it, on it is we would never, the artists own everything that they create. And we really see ourselves more as facilitators. So even when, so as an example, we worked with um, on the Zaha Hadid early paintings and drawings. And it might just be interesting in terms of how that came up, just to discuss how that came about. Because actually a project like that, which ended up in a VR installation, but it didn't start in that way. It started very much with, I think it was Hans Ulrich who you know, said um, that Zaha Hadid always said there should be no end to experimentation. And um, we have a relationship and certain time galleries are a partner and it's like, let's have a conversation. And one thing that I'm always keen on is not to start with, um, with the technology. And actually the amount of times we get approached by saying, oh, can we, uh, like, you know, um, arts organisations or I might say, I really want to, so it's particularly more arts organisations may say they want to create a 360 film or we want to do a VR. And I'm like, well, that's not a starting point. Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> it's a different way to look at that question. That if, if at the moment there is some kind of uh, involvement from external parties, which is shaping the, the narrative, is that really actually a challenge to curation? I mean, Kay is one of the kind of first generation of virtual reality curators. Are there things that places like the Courtauld Institute as a teaching institute should be learning about what it means to curate in a virtual reality space that are different from the skills that you're learning elsewhere? It's an interesting question. Um, I think, I mean, we can talk maybe specifically about the Zaha Hadid project might be interesting to, to go into one of the projects that and um, Freya and I were part of the team. Um, and I think it's good to, to mention, as you said, that the way that this project came about was um, we were holding an exhibition of Zaha Hadid's early paintings and drawings. I don't know if any of you saw it, but um, these paintings and drawings are very much became were part of this early design process. They're very dynamic images, you know, exploring movement and the possibilities of design. And Zaha Hadid architects have always been very pioneering in their use of technology. And when this dialogue started, um, it became apparent that maybe VR was this perfect medium to be able to explore the, the designs, the ideas behind some of these designs in a, in a virtual space. So um, the, the VR experiences were kind of almost like explosions of the paintings exploring the movement um, that Zaha Hadid was utilising through gesture. Um, so, so that was the creation of, the, of these VR works. I don't know if there's any more I can... And I think it was just, and it's very much so, in terms of, you know, talking about kind of Google's involvement there, was, so the, you know, certain of the curators, but the Zaha Hadid kind of um, studio, 
they lay it on all kind of on the creative. We're we're not trying to we're, we're not the lab isn't set up to be we don't want to be creators in the art space. What we want to look at um, is for is more being a kind of like innovation partner for the cultural sector and looking at how we how we explore that. And I think it's about exploring exploring it collaboratively, but being truly collaborative. And that means, you know, and starting really early on projects where it starts with this is this is what we want to explore, this is what we want to yeah. say, and then looking at kind of okay, what's the best technology? So so there's then like the production of these works and then there was the other you know part which was how do we show it in the gallery space within this is a paintings and drawings an exhibition, how do we display the art? Um, because we've never done it before, so um, <laughs> so we uh, what ended up happening is we had we, we were only able to have uh, two stations for the virtual reality within the exhibition space. Um, trying to a huge part of it is is how you where's your body when you're in the exhibition space. So like should you be standing? Should you be, should you be sitting down? Um, are you going to fall over? Are you going to bump into someone? All of these like really practical problems. How many people at once? How many people? Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, that, I think that's what's really that's a big question and something to explore is around kind of the collective experience. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't think it's great to be queuing for this one, you, you, having huge queues in museums and galleries waiting for this moment where they can put on the headset. And how do we? How do we go beyond that so that it isn't about kind of queuing and waiting for your turn? Um, and how do we look at it as a collective? Um, so, yeah, I mean, of course, like the, the RA did it by um, doing like time slots that we booked and paid quite a lot for. And um, it, it kind of, apart from making the whole thing feel a bit to me like a dentist waiting room, it kind of um, it puts a cap on how many people can see this thing, yeah. you know? Like, there's so many hundreds of people that can see this ever. And that's something we're really, like at Google, really interested in exploring in terms of how there are other ways to experience virtual reality rather than just in a solitary headset and where, where will that go? Well, I mean, we're starting to see that as kind of immersive spaces and the power of things like digital projection and some of these other tools that aren't putting a headset on are definitely opening this up. For any of you who've seen it, an amazing organisation in Korea called Media and Arts, who take done the pieces of the, like the Van Gogh Museum, where they've created these virtual uh, spaces, taking things like Starry Night, the, uh, who runs the Culture Institute's classic example of digital artwork, uh, and breaking it up to be projected into a warehouse in downtown Seoul. Where so the grass along the floor is projected along the floor and you kind of walk through it, and the flowers sit up upon the wall, and the church sits on the wall ahead of you. And it's a kind of virtual reality environment made from a painting that's really bringing that out into space, into a different kind of physical space. Part of this niggles away at the, the question anyone who works in digital in museums always gets asked in things like this, which is when is the point where, because you're not, uh, where digital means you don't need the museum anymore. My answer for most of that, most of the time, is always you need the object. This is about coming into contact with human beings, objects and artworks, being in the same space as each other and consuming that. Virtual reality as an artistic practice is an interesting challenge to whether that bit that I've always managed to get away with still holds. Because if you are consuming virtual reality in a virtual world, and if the method of getting, getting access to it in gallery spaces is a bit odd, frankly, why do you need the gallery anymore? <laughs> that was not five questions. <laughs> uh, well, there are many things that I could bring up. First, first of all, so in terms of I'm going to refer back to Zaha Hadid again. Um, in the gallery space, the way that it was um, shown was with um, uh, was the it's the best equipment that we can buy, buy. <laughs> or get our hands on. Um, it was, yeah, it was chosen because it was the right. 
restaurant. Yeah. yeah. That's the highest resolution. It's got the yeah. best. Yeah. It's, 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 it's visually the, the richest, exactly. richest and quickest in the music at the moment. But, but now. Yeah. But now. <laughs> also, in terms of sound, um, really, you know, really good quality headphones. We spent a lot of time thinking about seating, um, which I now know a lot about revolving seats. Um, there was then this other element to it where we released um, the 360s for use with Google Cardboard uh, online afterwards. Um, I don't think that there's ever been that the virtual space is going to, in this, the way we're talking about it, is going to. Um, you know, the, the, exactly. The yeah, the exactly. I mean, I think it's interesting um, to think about. I, I think there are just some very different ways in which to experience VR and AR. I haven't even talked about AR yet, but um, and. Sorry, no, 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 I just realised it's really fun. Because in terms of what you're saying, I think there's there's a, in, a, a are you meaning also in terms of so like a 360 experience of VR in terms of an entire exhibition as well? Because I think that's you know so you could say, but I I think that nothing everything that would excite me to want to go and see something physically. I think well, nothing beats the physical presence. But if the artwork is made in virtual reality and is consumed in virtual reality, right. yeah. why do you need to go somewhere to do that? What, what is the it's a point of access, isn't it? Really, at the, at the moment, I think it's important that institutions <laughs> provide this point of access, and I think it's uh, a way of thinking about it. Um, mm -hmm. The artwork is, it makes a point of making an analogous object, like with the um, John Rackman, he's at freeze with the, uh, the snake. Mm -hmm. because I, I did queue up 45 minutes to go and sit in that, which was interesting, but um, also you can download it as part of the Rhizo map, and it's, they're yeah. really, really different experiences, yeah. they're just not the yeah. same. Like even yeah. in the cardboard, they're not the same experience. Like, yeah. e even the queuing and how oppressive that was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but is this a chance for you? I used to work in publishing, but there was always a fear in publishing that when digital came and you got to e-books, the author doesn't need the publisher anymore, right? Because you can go straight to the market, Put your ebook onto Amazon and sell it direct to the consumer. Yeah, sure, is this to your it. chance uh, as an artist creating in a virtual? Do you know how much money these things cost? <laughs> <laughs> and they still need to change. It's a good thing. It's not the same form of technology. And I think more and more, as, as more and more people that can like create, and as the you, uh, can be creators because you know. TikTok is the example. Everyone can take photos constantly. <coughs> I think in terms of the role of the curator becomes even more important because I think we'll be looking to trusted voices in terms of to help us navigate through kind of so much information that's out there. Good. This is the challenge, this is the interesting challenge for the years ahead, is that one of the things that amazing technology does is it kind of puts value chains up for grabs. The role of the artist, the role of the gallery, the role of the museum, the role of the consumer, the role of the art market, that it, you know, all in the form of the work, all of these things, that's what's really interesting, I think, in the next 10 years, 20 years, is all of these things are probably up for grabs in a different way. And if virtual reality then can do anything, it can disrupt a system that's created itself one way and make a different system that looks a different way as a result of it. And um, I think you are seeing different... Uh, I. The Serpentine is a, is a gallery that does not have a collection, and I think there's um, maybe we're using VR in a different way to the way that museum collections might be using it in terms of um, enhancing or getting um, uh, get, well, reaching a wider audience in terms of thinking about what the, the cultural value of that institution. I mean, I think cultural values are important in this conversation. Um, uh, and in terms of, we have um, the arm is like this learning or discovery tool, and we also have it as a creative tool, an artist being able to change the way that you see the world. So I think that there were, I mean, there, there are so many uses within this, this sort of context of art, um, and they, they have slightly different. Um, I think that's a great way actually to now 
turn to you guys and see if there are any questions from the floor. So we're coming into the last 15 minutes now. It'll be great to see any, any questions from anyone about any of the things you've heard so far tonight.